When we are children, our parents tell us not to talk about shit. This is a really serious problem. What you don't talk about, you cannot improve. A lot of people call me Mr. Toilet. I'm really proud when I hear that because it gives an identity to the work that I do. 40% of the world population still do not have access to a simple toilet. Shit is like fire. If you manage properly, the fire can cook your meal. If you don't manage it, it burns down your house. If you manage shit, it becomes a fertilizer. If you don't manage it, it kills you. About 90% of all the surface water in India are contaminated by feces. 1.5 million children under five a year in the world die unnecessarily. You have to have clean water, you have to have safe sanitation. A rich man staying next to a slum. The flies doesn't know a poor man from a rich man. So the rich man is probably eating the shit of the poor man. You better help them get toilets or you will eat their shit. Think about it. We are hosting the World Toilet Summit. This has been an international event every year since 2001. The people say, why should I use a toilet? It's fresh air outside. I can chit chat with my friend while I'm squatting there. A big breakthrough will happen when we look at the poor as if they are customers. When we have to sell them products that are very beautiful and sexy. Once this becomes object of desire, if you don't have, you're not keeping up with the Jonas's. We want toilets to become a status symbol for the poor so that they feel proud to own a toilet. Just like a Louis Vuitton handbag. <laughs> <laughs> we are actually breaking the taboo on sanitation in the global news. World Toilet Day is 19 November every year. We have the big squad. We are protesting the plight of the 2.5 billion people that still do not have access to a toilet. The fact is I think about toilet every moment. A life is only 80 years. I'm 52. If I'm going to spend 28 years consuming ostentatiously just to have a diamond watch that I can't read the time because it's too sparkling, it makes no sense. Doing social work that is creating some impact, I think it's better to die like that. I think we can see the day that everybody on planet Earth will have access to clean toilets any day, any time. <laughs>
about a subject that's so disgusting. It is not a panda. It is... <laughs> it's not a whale, a shark, or a Bengali tiger. So, in this session, I'm trying to tell you how it's done. For those who, who know Singapore, it always seems to be a rich country immediately, but in the 1960s, it was poorer than Cambodia and Philippines. This is myself, and we grew up in slums. So we don't have real clothing. We have only new clothes every year, one set. So a lot of us run around with just shirts and no pants, and I see a lot of the other kids having worms coming out of their butt, wriggling like a tail. And it's a real problem. So when we grew up in this environment, we realized that actually this problem is, is serious. But in a very short time, Singapore became a first world country because it invested in health, hygiene, vocational training, and all the rest. So I started doing business, and after 16 businesses, I made some money. And at 40, I started to realize that life is only 80 years. Which means if you multiply 40 by 365, I've only 14,600 days left to live. So it became very urgent. <laughs> I started to clean up the public toilets in Singapore as a hobby. So I was still doing business. And I saw that the shopping centers, the toilets are not very good. And I went to explain to the shopping center that you're losing a lot of customer. If your toilets are dirty, they'll leave your building to the hotel or go home, and they will leave with their credit cards and wallet. And then you lose a lot of impulse buying, which is about 95% of all the purchases. Then suddenly, everybody gets very interested to make the toilets good. I went to the school to tell principals that the children, marks are very low because they can't concentrate when they're holding their bladder. So you're going to make the toilet in the school not smelly. And the principals are also buying in. So suddenly, everybody likes to have toilets. I made the logo RA because it's restricted artistic, like in a movie, right? So I eventually discovered that ladies queuing up for public toilets when gents don't have to. I studied carefully and realized that the gents doesn't have menstruation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the ladies, the ladies takes about 105 seconds to urinate, and the gents has only 35 seconds because they just zip, pee, zip, and they don't wash their hands. <laughs> so, <laughs> what we need is, for every urino in the gents, the ladies need to have a cubicle. So, when you put the ladies and the gents same size, you can't squeeze in so many cubicles. So, while the women have been liberated, their toilet has not been liberated. So we start to change the code of practice in buildings. And in 2005, Singapore government agreed to change the law. And all the ladies' toilets in new buildings are really, really large. No more queue. I'm glad to report that in America last year, all federal buildings have to have the same code of practice to have a lot of uh, toilets for the ladies. And I hope you can write and voice uh, to your local government or your congressman that all toilets should be like that. <laughs> and the law was changed by a man. Yeah? <laughs> so when I first started the World Toilet Organization, there were 15 toilet associations around the world without headquarters. And I thought, OK, how do I start this organization and really leverage the media? Because we don't have money, resources, authority, no, no permission, nothing. So I thought of this very sinister plan to play the pun on the World Trade Organization by calling ourselves the WTO. <laughs> so only two things can happen. First, if World Trade Organization, which is usually very busy and stuck in Doha, would uh, not notice us, then we could play the pun all the time and stay in the news. And the other thing that could happen is they get angry and they sue me. Then it will go really big in the news. 
So you either win or you win big, you can't lose. <laughs> I say when you're sitting on the floor, you can't fall down, right? <laughs> so it works very well, and uh, they did not sue me, and we keep on going to the news. With the legitimacy of the press, lots of other people start to come in to support. We all know this problem, 2.6 billion people don't have toilets, but actually it is a business opportunity. It means 500 million of home toilets and another 500 million toilets in the workplace, in the school, in the churches, temple, mosque, in the marketplace, in transport center, in recreational centers. So we need 1 billion toilets all over the world, but there's no supply. And this is the situation when there's no supply. Every morning, all the men would squat along this side of the road. And they have designated place. This is their parking lot. It's a fixed place. And all the women will be over the other side of the road. And this situation happened twice a day, after sunset and before sunrise. And what happened is the flies goes to the poop and start spreading into the food of other of the food of children and adults and diarrhea happen, people are sick and children die. One and a half million children die every year. In fact, last week in China, they have a two flies rule that if the toilet have one fly, it's okay, but if you have two fly, we'll find you. So CNN.com says this is a very strange law. And uh, they asked me for comment. They said, what do you think about this law? I said, if you have one fly, you have lots of flies because flies doesn't breed one by one. Right? So we declare that the toilets should be no fly zone. <laughs> <laughs> it's always when you have opportunity to use pun that you stay, uh, make the awareness very, very high. In, in slums, there are no space for toilet, so we need community toilet polluted rivers everywhere. And in Af Africa, there's a habit of flying toilet. They take Coke bottle, they cut it into half, they put plastic bag, they poop into it, then they tie it and they throw. So you are walking around the slum, you have to be very, very careful to miss them. So this street, I'm in the taxi here, and the street is full of, full of shit. And the children at the distance are playing barefooted, so this is again so dangerous. How do I turn all this thing around? I use it, use humor. Because sanitation has been in the shadow of water. When you put what sun, you're like putting your grandmother next to Miss Universe <laughs> or Angelina Jolie. So when everybody is looking at this glamorous subject, they forgot that there's also a very important subject, sanitation. So how do you do, make the grandmother very sexy? You make her tell jokes. And you use humor to break the taboo. And this is the kind of sacrifice that I do for photographs. <laughs> and this is in the National Geographic um, Channel documentary, The Toilet Man. I think it's still screening every once in a while on, on TV. We also do open source uh, campaign where we got designer who volunteer to design. We, we, we recruit designer from anywhere. And then we make open source files, send it to anybody who wants to download it. They print it themselves and put it on plywood stand ups and put it in the heart of town to show people that there are 2.6 billion who don't have toilet. And this is myself, and this is the German Toilet Organization president. And this is right in the banking district in Zurich, in front of Credit Suisse Bank and Prada. <laughs> we also hold philanthropy forum in the Ritz Carlton Ladies' Toilet. So we have 27 people, full house. <laughs> we wallpaper this. So these are high net worth individuals. And they go back and tell their friends. It's like the spreadsheet model, yeah. So I started this uh, World Toilet Summit in 2001. I don't have money to host a summit, so I went to an organizer for a building show and tell him, if I could sell exhibition space for you, 
can you give me a free conference? And he said, yes, if you can sell so many booths, you were on. And I started the World Toilet Summit free of charge. And with the media, then every year, there are other people who want to host World Toilet Summit. We have now 12 World Toilet Summit, and I didn't pay a single cent. I just behave as if I'm the Olympic, and I give up hosting rights. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, Beijing Tourism Board, and they hosted uh, it in preparation of the World Toilet, uh, the, the, the Olympic in 2008. So they renovated 4,000 public toilet board in, uh, it blocks in uh, Beijing. And this is in, in Thailand. And here we have Lord Mayor of Belfast, who just became the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> he hosted World Toilet Summit uh, using this um, American's money for this armament of the IRA. And um, even up to now, the Republican has been uh, accusing the Democrats for earmarking and, and flushing, toilet down the, uh, flushing money down the toilets. So I sent uh, an email, I didn't get a reply, to invite, to invite uh, Mitt Romney to the next World Toilet Summit, and it's in, in Durban this year. We also have a World Toilet Summit in Moscow, and we visited the Space Center with the um, toilets in space and also how the astronauts, the cosmonauts do it in pee in their pants in, the, in, the, in space. In 2007, the status elevated very high and the um, president of India came to open the World Toilet Summit with six ministers and the Gandhi family. Then the Crown Prince of Holland came to grace the, the occasion as well. So as you can see, with zero sand, we can do quite a bit. No. Yeah, okay. So this is an image of a future project that's coming up, the World Toilet Museum. So how do I build a World Toilet Museum? I went to Hainan Island and I talked to the governor and I said, you don't have many tourism sites. Would you like to have a World Toilet Museum? <laughs> and they say, what is it? And I say, you know, there's the culture of toilet, the history of toilet, and the technological advance of toilet. And he says, this sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Can you send me a proposal? So I went to Denmark and found an architect who designed museums. And I asked him, would you like to design a toilet museum? And he said, what is it? <laughs> and I tell him the same thing. And he came up with this concept that's really beautiful. On plan elevation, it looked like three toilet roll into one. And right now, they, I went back to the governor, and he offered me three pieces of land, and I'm looking for investors and planning how to do this. We have World Toilet Summit, and the 19th November of 2001 was our founding day. We declared that day World Toilet Day. And just because we call it World Toilet Day, the whole world starts celebrating World Toilet Day. So World Toilet Day last year reached uh, 1 billion people. We also have a World Toilet College. Again, I have no money, no teacher, no student, no curriculum, no school. <laughs> so what I did is uh, I went to the Singapore Polytechnic to say, can I make a joint venture with you to build a World Toilet College using your building? And they said, yes. So suddenly I have teachers and, and school, but I don't have curriculum. So I went to the uh, Minister of Union to say that low-wage workers, the toilet cleaners, needs an upgrading so we can get the Japanese, who are very good, to train them and take the curriculum. So eventually, I have everything. <laughs> then recently, three years ago, we started Sandy Shop Micro Franchise to teach the poor to produce toilet and sell it themselves because charity buying can only happen one time, and after you spend the money, nothing happens the following day, right? So if you teach people to fish, it's much better to, than to give them fish. So I'll explain this sandy shop concept. What we do is we train the poor to become entrepreneurs, and we create jobs and make sanitation affordable so that the people can buy. Each toilet costs $35 per family. 
And we use visual branding. Again, if you see the logo, you see cool pee and you're happy. <laughs> In any language, it works the same. <laughs> so this is a, a businessman who is started a factory. The factory cost 1,000 US dollar to invest. And with 1,000 dollar, he start to have still more casting toilets. And he earns 5 dollars per toilet. So he get back his money after selling 200 toilets. And the sales girls, uh, village woman, they earn one to two dollars commission every time they sell a toilet. So when, we, when the woman earns money, they also have a little bit more power at home talking to their mother-in-law and their husband. So um, they deliver sanitation sustainably because it's profitable. We create jobs and we create gender equality. This is a technology that is quite common. And again, I don't know very much about technology, so I just copy shamelessly from IDEO. <laughs> then we realize that when we tell people to buy toilets because of health and hygiene, it's very difficult because they heard it before, but people are not rational. People are emotional. So when we go and sell toilets, we try to start with some influential person like the wife of the village chief and have a toilet, then let her brag about it and make the toilet really nice and respectable. And when people start to see it as a status symbol, they start to buy. Aspirational marketing works in the village, in the slum, just as it works in the shopping mall over here. People buy the things to impress the people they don't like. So when somebody has toilet, the other one don't have, then jealousy becomes a very strong marketing tool. <laughs> and of course, other things like love for your children, filial piety for the elders, and all the rest. So shame, pride, these are all very, very important marketing tools, and it works very well. <laughs> then we have very satisfied customer, if you can see from her face. President Clinton invited me to make a commitment at CGI, Clinton Global Initiative, and we have a fundraising commitment. So President Clinton's commitment is quite simple. I give you the photograph, you do the fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2008, I was also named a hero of the environment, and this gives more legitimacy for the work that we do. We found this lady, Nishi Nash. I think she's quite popular, Pin House. And together, we went to um, New York Central Station to give out 10,000 tickets for people to go to Flushing. <laughs> we sent them Flushing. And we have 135 media overnight. So here's a Unilever coming and said to us, we like to be official sponsor of World Toilet Day, and then they help us do a lot of media, and they gave us some money as well. So if you go Google, you have 60 million mentioned. We have, last year we reached out to 1 billion audience. And in 2010, coincidentally, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 premiered all over the world on World Toilet Day. <laughs> After all, it's still about pots, isn't it? They rank on Twitter fourth position, and we rank fifth. But we spend nothing, and we rank fifth, and we beat Justin Bieber, who ran sixth. <laughs> so since it's so well received, we are now proposing it to be a UN day. We hope that it happens. The film that you watch is actually in Sundance Film Festival this year in Utah and it also went to Berlin Film Festival. So finally, we have to reconcile, no? I'm not sure whether World Trade Organization were happy. So finally, I met the head of World Trade Organization, Pascal Army, <laughs> and we became friends. 
So I know that he's not going to sue me anymore. <laughs> so since I spent, spent so much time with you, my life became shorter. I have now 8,950 days more to live. I urge you, if you come to this planet, make a difference before you go. Because if you come to serve only one person yourself, it doesn't make a difference whether you're here or you came or not. So try your best to go out tonight, tell your family about toilets, and tell all your friends about this issue, and make them very upset and angry, and make them try to do something about it. Thank you very much.